but uh, would you like to introduce um, the next yeah, speaker? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, quickly moving on to the uh, uh, next plenary as well. Um, may I introduce Dr. Charita Herath, uh, consultant cardiologist at Bayes Hospital Homagama. He'll be talking to us about anticoagulation in cardiovascular diseases. Over to you, Charita. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Charita Herath, consultant cardiologist at Bayes Hospital Homagama. Today, my topic is anticoagulation in cardiovascular disease. So, first of all, uh, we'll uh, understand what is anticoagulation. That is a medication that is used to prevent and treat blood clots in blood vessels and the heart. We also call it as blood thinners. So, under the topic of anticoagulation in cardiovascular disease, these are the subtopics which I am going to uh, explore during this presentation. That is coagulation cascade, basic understanding about the common drugs and how drugs work, and few common indications in cardiovascular medicine. So let's uh, go through uh, briefly go through go through this uh, coagulation cascade. So this is the cascade where finally blood clot forms. So there are two pathways, intrinsic pathway as well as extrinsic pathway. So with different stimuli like tissue damage or surface contact, series of factors being activated through intrinsic pathway or extrinsic pathway and finally activate factor 10 to factor 10A, that is initiation of final common pathway. So factor 10A will convert prothrombin to thrombin and thrombin will convert fibrinogen to fibrin to form a stable fibrin clot. This will be facilitated by factor 13A, which is also activated through thrombin. So this is basic coagulation cascade, which resulting in clot formation or thrombus formation. So what we do in anticoagulation is to try to block this pathway from somewhere, some specific area to prevent blood clot formation. So we use several drugs for that. So there are oral drugs as well as parenteral drugs. So common, one of the commonest drugs is warfarin, we all know that, which is using orally and which is a vitamin K antagonist. And there are newer anticoagulation, oral anticoagulation drugs Although these things are newer anticoagulation drugs to us, which is been in the market for several years now in other countries, and they are commonly using it, namely dabigatran, apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and batrixaban. Those are the <coughs> sorry, those are the oral anticoagulation, and there are other set of parenteral anticoagulation as well, heparins and heparinoids. So unfractionated heparin and low molecular heparin, commonly be known as Enoxaparin. And also, although we don't use much commonly, Fundoferinox, Danaparoid, and Bivalerine. All these are available in our setup. So, in future, we may be using those things more. So, let's try to understand how these drugs act on coagulation cascade. So, basically, warfarin is a vitamin K antagonist, as I mentioned you before. So, warfarin, is, vitamin K is involving to producing factors such as 2, 7, 9, 10. 2, 7, 9, and 10. So those factors are dependent on vitamin K. So if warfarin blocks, vitamin, inhibit vitamin K, this factor production is inhibited. So coagulation cascade can't operate without these factors. So that's what warfarin does in our coagulation pathway. And Rioroxaban, apixaban, edoxaban, and batrixaban, those are newer oral anticoagulant drugs, which directly inhibit factor 10A. Fundoferinox and heparin will inhibit factor, sorry, fundoferinox will inhibit factor 10A through antitombin 3, and heparin and low molecular weight heparin will inhibit factor 2A through antithrombin 3. So, those are the common drugs which block different areas of anticoagulation, uh, the coagulation cascade. So, by with this basic understanding, what is coagulation, 
what is the coagulation cascade leading to clot formation and what are the drugs which act on different sites at coagulation pathway will move on to clinical indication so there are several cardiovascular disease conditions where we use anticoagulation so sometimes we use anticoagulation as treatment that is for acute coronary syndromes dvt and pulmonary embolism sometimes we use these anticoagulation drugs to prevent stroke especially in at atrial fibrillation people who are on prosthetic heart valves and people who has got lv thrombus following heart failure and as well as dvt prophylaxis so there are certain other diseases which are not related to directly related to the cardiovascular medicine needing anticoagulation such as anti phospholipid syndrome and some other connective tissue disorders so let's go through one by one for the time being so my first indication is acute coronary syndrome we all know that it, that includes st elevation myocardial infarction non st elevation myocardial infarction and unstable angina when patients present with acute coronary syndrome we know that if it is stemi we straight away thrombolyze patient with tenecteplase or valdepase or else we send for primary pci to fix the block with the stent but apart from that sometimes we manage stemi also medically and non stemi and unstable angina we anticoagulate those patients to prevent further progression of blood clot we commonly use subcutaneous enoxaparin with loading dose followed by 1 mg per kg every 12 hours let's say patient is 60 kg we use 60 kg bd dose or else we can use unfractionated heparin as well problem with unfractionated heparin is we have to give it as a infusion so close monitoring is mandatory instruments are necessary so it is practically bit difficult in ward setup that's why we commonly use enoxaparin but advantage of heparin is heparin has got very short half life and it can be easily revert when patient is bleeding let's say we started heparin and patient started bleeding so we can immediately stop heparin infusion and give reversal medication and to control the bleeding but let's say if we have given enoxaparin 60 mg dose in one hour if patient st- starts bleeding we already has given full dose so that is the advantage of heparin so apart from heparin and enoxaparin we can give fundofarinox and bivalvulin but commonly these things are not in practice but fundofarinox is has got more or less same efficacy as enoxaparin and much cheaper so we should as cardiology team we should try to push authorities to make fundofarinox available for future use for the patients and how to choose as you can see there are different types enoxaparin heparin fundofarinox bivalvulin several types of anticoagulation which can be used in acute coronary syndrome and we need to select according to the patient let's say patient present with non stemi and we we know that we need to give anticoagulation what anticoagulation so let's say if patient if we are planning to send this patient for intervention in terms of uh pci to a tertiary care center then we should select drugs with very short half life that is unfractionated heparin or bivalvulin which has got less than 2 hour half life so we can use those drugs the patient on patients who are sending for pci if patient is only medically managed we can use any of these drugs but low molecular weight heparin that is enoxaparin is much user friendly and also fund of heroin so next indication next topic is dvt or pulmonary embolism as you can see in this picture these pictures what happened in dvt is there will be thrombus formation in deep veins in the peripheries like legs or abdomen or pelvis vessels which can migrate into uh, through the inferior vena cava into the right heart can be embolized into the pulmonary vasculature so if pulmonary vasculature is blocked it causes pulmonary embolism so this can be major or minor if patient is unstable we should immediately thrombolyze the patient with alteplase or tenecteplase and there's a, a way of treating a major pulmonary embolism with 
Angbal is a with catheter directed thrombolysis as well, but which is not commonly practiced in Sri Lanka. But let's say if patient is stable with pulmonary embolism, definitely patient should be on anticoagulation. So first line drug we use at the moment is subcutaneous enoxaparin 1 mg per kg followed by warfarin for at least 3 months. During admission, we can continue enoxaparin, then convert to the warfarin and we can discharge the patient at least for three months. But after three months, we need to reassess the patient and depending on the patient's uh, etiology and the clinical conditions and other parameters, individually, we can decide whether we need to continue long, longer term anticoagulation or stop after three months. So apart from enoxaparin, warfarin combination, we can use rivaroxaban, apixaban as well. Unfortunately, these things are not uh, freely available in Sri Lanka. So other thing is atrial fibrillation uh, during day-to-day uh, clinical practice. We all see these kind of patients very commonly. So what happened is uh, there's a problem in electrical system in the heart. So there will be electrical storm or abnormal electrical impulses generating in the left atrium mainly or right atrium, which is uh, you know, leading to fibrillation of cardiac chambers. So there is no proper contractions, uh, instead of contractions, there will be fibrillating of these chambers, which increases the risk of blood clot formation inside these chambers. So if there's a blood clot formation inside these chambers, which can migrate and embolize into the brain, causing stroke. So atrial fibrillation is also one of the common indications for anticoagulation. So when patients present with anticoagulation, we categorize those patients whether they are at high risk of stroke or low risk. So we use this CHADVES score. Everybody has uh, heard about this. Congestive cardiac failure, hypertension, age, diabetes, stroke. So depending on these scores, we calculate final score. If it is more than two, more than two, definitely that two or more, patient needs anticoagulation with drugs, that is apixaban, rivaroxaban, or dabigatrin. But unfortunately, we don't have those drugs freely in our setup. So that's why we anticoagulate them with BKA, that is warfarin. But disadvantage of warfarin is we need to closely monitor with PTINR, which is, which is very cumbersome for the patient. At the same time, warfarin is quite indicated, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, common with, uh, uh, interact with other drugs. So. That's how we decide anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. So, another major indication is prosthetic heart valve. We all know if patient is on prosthetic heart valve, they are at high risk of thrombus formation. So, depending on their type of processes, whether it is mitral or aortic, whether concurrent comorbidities and bleeding risk, we need to decide on anticoagulation. So, if it is a bioprosthetic valve, definitely patient should be on warfarin for three months, and then we can convert into the aspirin. But if patient is on mechanical valve, patient should be on warfarin for lifelong with close monitoring. If it is mitral valve, INR target should be around three. If it is aortic, it can be around two. The, all these depends on type of valve. But in this particular instance, NOAX, that is apixaban, dabicatrin, those classes, are contraindicated in mechanical prosthetic valve. Only anticoagulation we can use is vitamin K antagonist warfarin. Other common one thing, co- common indication is LV thrombus. So after the heart failure, if patient uh, contractions are poor, as you can see in this picture, there may be thrombus formation in the LV. So we have to anticoagulate at least for three months with warfarin or newer anticoagulants and then reassess. And if it is remaining, we have to continue longer period. But heart failure per se, if there is no thrombus, there is no strong indication for anticoagulation. We can individually assess the patient and if high risk only, we can go for anticoagulation. And other thing is pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is one of the other entity where we use anticoagulation, but there are different types of different classes of pulmonary hypertension depending on the etiology. So class four, type four pulmonary hypertension is due to recurrent thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So we use anticoagulation on that category, but other types of pulmonary hypertension, there is no proper indication. And other thing is DVT, uh, prophylaxis. If patients who are at high risk of thrombus prevention, like pregnant ladies, patients with past history of VTE, patients with immobility, 
ocasinoma they are at high risk of uh, forming thrombus in the lower legs so they should when admitted they should be on dvt prophylaxis so that is my brief presentation so i think uh, we have summarized this uh, anticoagulation common indication for anticoagulation in cardiovascular disease uh, uh, if you have any questions i'm happy to answer and uh, thank you very much for listening and giving me the opportunity for presentation thank you uh, thank you very much charita for that uh, very detailed um, um, uh, discussion um, uh, you made a very complex subject quite simple and understanding and i hope uh, the audience appreciates that well as well um um sandamari will uh, introduce the next and last lecture for our plenaries